this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. All right, so just as a brief introduction, this is Caitlin Butler. She is a PGY2 critical care pharmacy resident at Baycare Morton Plant Hospital. And today she's going to be presenting on pre-hospital transexamic acid for severe trauma. This is the PATCH trauma trial. So throughout this presentation, I'm planning to cover some pathophysiological contributors following a trauma traumatic event. I'll also discuss the mechanism and the role that TXA has post-trauma tra patients, and also discuss the impact that this patch trauma trial is going to have on clinical practice. So to start with a little background, hemorrhage is the most common cause of death following severe trauma, accounting to, for about 30 to 40 percent of trauma-related deaths. There are two primary mechanisms in which can occur alone or simultaneously. The first is a direct injury to the blood vessels, which is gonna be local, localized to the site of injury. And the severity of this mechanism is gonna be dependent upon the anatomy, meaning like artery or minor vein. The second major mechanism is termed trauma-induced coagulopathy or TIC. This is a state of hyperfibrinolysis as well as hypercoagula hypercoagulation, and it's going to cause a widespread microvascular hemorrhage. It's in this state that hemorrhage is going to become more complex to control since it is so widespread. However, it does only affect about 25% of trauma patients. So in a patient that has TIC, following a traumatic event, we do get activation of the coagulation system, which is going to cause an increase in tissue factor production and trauma generation to promote that clot formation. When a patient's in a hemorrhagic shock, however, we get activation of tissue plasminogen activator or increased release of TPA, causing fibrinolysis of those clots. TXA is going to have a role here by competing with TPA for the inhibition of the activation of plasminogen. In the later phases of TIC, however, there is an increase in plasminogen activator inhibitor, or PAI1, which is going to inhibit TPA. Because of this, TXA does become less beneficial the further out from trauma or the further out from the injury. And so it's recommended to actually give TXA within three hours because of this mechanism. It's also important to note that because of TXA's inhibition on fibrinolysis, there's also going to be an increased risk for thrombo thromboembolism. So there's now been many studies on using TXA in trauma patients, as well as some other patient populations as well. The two studies I have listed on this slide are going to assess its use when given pre-hospital, similar to what the patch trauma trial looked at. The first trial by Raul and colleagues, which was conducted in 2021, or excuse me, 2020, this was a randomized controlled trial that compared TXA one gram and two gram boluses when given pre-hospital to placebo. And they looked at patients that had moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries. In this trial, they found there was no difference in functional outcomes, which was determined by a Glasgow outcome scale extended score of greater than four. They also found no difference in mortality or thrombotic events. The next trial was the STAMP trial that was conducted in 2021. This was also a randomized controlled trial that compared TXA one gram boluses given within two hours of injury and prior to hospital arrival compared to a placebo. Um, this one looked at patients who were at risk for hemorrhage following injury, which was determined with hypotension, uh, determined as a systolic less than 90, or tachycardia with a heart rate greater than 110. Similarly, they found no difference in mortality or thrombotic events. Just to mention a few in-hospital trials that are going to be worth mentioning, including the landmark crash trials, both in which saw a reduction in mortality using TXA at 28 days. The CRASH-2 trial looked at trauma patients who were at increased bleeding risk, and the CRASH-3 trial looked at patients with a traumatic brain injury. The CRASH-3 trial also noted a reduction in mortality when given within the three-hour time window from injury. So this is uh, the trial that contributed to that recommendation to give TXA within three hours. And finally, we have the TAMPD trial that was conducted in 2022. This trial looked at early 2-gram versus 4-gram boluses compared to placebo, and they found a dose-dependent increase in thrombotic events compared to placebo. 
there again were multiple other studies uh, looking at TXA and trauma. However, I think the major point here is that all of these studies do offer mixed results. And that brings us to today's um, journal club. So this trial was an international double-blind randomized placebo control trial conducted between July 2014 and September 2021. The purpose was to evaluate TXA when given in severe trauma patients who were determined at high risk for TIC. A total of 1,310 patients were enrolled across 15 emergency medical services and 21 hospitals. Patients were then randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion and stratified according to Glasgow Coma Score at presentation. And then patients were assigned to receive either TXA, one gram bolus over 10 minutes, followed by one gram over eight hours they arrived at the hospital. I did want to note that there were a significant amount of protocol deviations and patients lost a follow-up amongst both groups. Um, there's actually about 30% in each group. So because of this, there were ultimately 572 patients in our TXA group and 559 patients in the placebo group that were included in the attention to treat protocol. Patients met inclusion criteria if they were suspected to have a severe traumatic injury, if they were determined to be high risk for TIC, which was defined as a code score of greater than or equal to three, and if the first dose was given within three hours of injury and prior to hospital arrival. Patients were excluded if they were pregnant or if they had resided in an older, a, a facility for older persons. The average demographic across both groups was 44-year-old white males, which is consistent with our typical population for trauma patients. Baseline characteristics were also very well balanced amongst both groups, including mechanism of injury, initial Glasgow coma score, coast scores, as well as time to the first dose. I do want to note, though, however, there were significantly more blunt traumas compared to other mechanisms of in injury, specifically penetrating and burn traumas. The primary outcome in the study was survival with favorable functional outcomes, which they defined as a score of five to eight on the Glasgow outcome scale extended. Although there were no statistically significant differences in this outcome, I do think it's important to note that TXA group was associated with less mortality at six months. However, they were also associated with greater disability compared to the placebo group, as you can see on this spectrum scale down at below. The study also conducted the following pre-specified subgroups for the primary outcome. They saw no statistics and statistically significant differences amongst these pre-specified subgroups. However, I think it's also worth noting here that the group of patients that received the study drug two hours after the injury, the outcomes did favor placebo, making it almost statistically significant. And as I mentioned earlier, TXA is recommended to give within three hours. However, I think the result of this subgroup kind of raises the question on if the window for TXA should actually be shorter than the three hour window that we currently follow. So continuing on with the results with our secondary outcomes, TXA was associated with a reduced short-term mortality at 28 days, as well as 24 hours. However, they didn't see any differences in mortality at six months. They also saw no difference in our vascular occlusive events or sepsis. They did also report a breakdown of cause of death as well as the type of vascular occlusive events, and none of those were statistically significant as well. All right, so for strengths and limitations, starting off with strengths, I, they did report both a modified intention to treat and per protocol outcomes, um, both of which did have similar outcomes between the two different protocols. They also conducted a sensitivity analysis in which the results were comparable to what was reported in the primary outcome. Our baseline characteristics were also very well balanced between the two groups, which is thus going to increase our internal validity of the study. And finally, the study was conducted in very well developed trauma systems, and thus it's going to be more generalizable to the majority of trauma systems that we see here in the United States. Some limitations. So the study did have a very high percentage of protocol deviations with about 30 to 35 percent in each group, which is going to decrease the internal validity of the study. The study also saw a very high rate of thrombotic events, upwards about 20% overall, which is significantly more than what was seen in previous trials. To give you an example, the CRASH trials only saw about 2% uh, th thrombotic event rate overall. And finally, the study primarily included blunt traumas, so they had a small population of penetrating and burn traumas, which is going to reduce the generalizability to those groups. So in conclusion, TXA did not improve survival uh, with favorable functional outcomes at six months. However, they did see an improvement in short-term survival at 24 hours and 28 days. 
but that group was also associated with greater disability with worse functional outcomes. And the rate of vascular occlusive events was high amongst both groups, but not statistically significant between the two groups. All right, and here's a list of my references. And that brings me to the end of this presentation, but I welcome any questions that you have. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.